May Lord Savior be glorified. It's uh, one of the Sundays where we are not in our series, the, the Road to Emmaus. So I thought uh, being Christmas and uh, the season, I would look at a passage that we don't often associate with Christmas, but is actually quite a relevant passage specifically for the Incarnation. You know, as we head into Christmas season, what they say is like after American Thanksgiving, it's okay to start playing Christmas songs. So we are now officially in Christmas season. We have our Christmas program uh, next week. Like Rudy said, we want to pray for that and invite people to come to the program. But, um, you know, Christmas is a time where we have the opportunity to uh, focus on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That is the birth of Christ. Or it's not just the birth, but the very uh, history around the event that God came into this world and added to himself humanity. That is God, the second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now something that happens often with us is that we can speed run uh, or we can go very quickly through the incarnation to reach to the cross. Right? Like that is a very common thing. And it's not a, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ himself told us that we have to remember him in his death. So it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But it is profitable once in a while to just focus on the incarnation itself. And Christmas uh, affords us an opportunity to do that where we should, you know, we are okay to just spend some time thinking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The first John is written by the Apostle John. We know the Gospel of John. The main theme of the Gospel of John is you know, the sonship uh, of Jesus Christ, uh, but specifically about the fact that the Son of God came into this world and took on flesh. You know, John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I think a lot of us are under the weather, so uh, better this week than next week. Uh, so, First John is the practical outpouring of the testimony of John chapter 1. For Christians who are living after the ascension of Jesus Christ, right? Whereas the Gospel of John focuses on the incarnation and the ministry of Christ, First John focuses on Christians who are living after Jesus Christ has returned to heaven. And in First John, John is again taking up this, uh, the proclamation of the core of Christianity as being the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It is one of the, the, the letters of John are one of the uh, latest, that is one of the last epistles to be written in the New Testament. And they're addressed to congregations in Asia Minor, which is uh, what uh, we now know as Turkey. And uh, these churches, maybe because they were a little uh, away from the center of the faith at that time, which was concentrated around uh, Jerusalem and Rome, you know, they were faced with a lot of false teaching. And these were people who had, unlike the Apostle John, they had not seen or heard or touched the Son of God while he was in this world. And so they were faced with a lot of false teaching that denied either the divinity of Christ, that Jesus Christ is not God, or more commonly at that time, the humanity of Christ, that Jesus Christ was God, but he was not actually a human being. He was not a man. Like He just appeared to be a man but it, he was not really flesh and blood. And what John says is that that false teaching 
uh, not only leads to a false confession of faith, that is, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is both God and man after the incarnation, you are not a true confessor of the faith. But the lack of confession leads to a lack of love and service among the people of those churches. That's what we see in the letters of John. So in Christianity, without truth, there cannot be fruit. At least there cannot be Christian fruit. If you don't have Christian truth, you cannot have Christian fruit. And what is that truth that John wants to proclaim? He wants to proclaim the truth of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I call the sermon uh, the greatest miracle uh, because I took it from an essay by C.S. Lewis called, uh, actually, I, I forget what the, I think the essay is called The Grand Miracle. And what he says is that, you know, every religion in the world, outside of Christianity, every other religion, yes, some of them have miracles, but they don't depend on miracles for the core of the faith. Like you take Buddhism, Buddhism has many miracles, but no one actually cares about the miracles of Buddhism because Buddhism is so focused on uh, this concept of nirvana and so on. In fact, you could say that in Buddhism, the, the miracles are uh, mostly contradict the actual teaching of the faith. Even like Islam, Islam has miracles, you know, the angel appearing to Muhammad and all that. If you ask a Muslim how central is that to your faith, they, well, it's not that central. That's not core, you know, they don't, they don't celebrate the revealing of the Quran to Muhammad. It's not core to their faith. But Christianity is not like that. Christianity rests on uh, what uh, C.S. Lewis says is the story of one grand miracle. That is the assertion that he who is beyond all space and time, who is uncreated, eternal, he came into nature, into human nature, he descended into his own universe and, ro and rose again, taking that nature back up with him. It is one great miracle. And if you take that away, there's nothing Christian about Christianity. There may be many admirable things that such a faith shares with all the other uh, faiths in the world, but there would be nothing that is specifically Christian. So if you take away the incarnation, there is no Christianity. And every other miracle in the Bible is either a part of the incarnation, or as we were seeing in the, in the series, they prepare for the incarnation or the result from the incarnation. And if there is no incarnation, nothing else holds. So in today's world, you know, we face a lot of false teaching as well, but generally in today's world, we do not have the false teaching where Jesus Christ is only God and not man. It's the reverse, right? There are a lot of people believe that Jesus Christ was man, but do not believe that he is God. Uh, you know, that there's that famous, uh, I don't know, I think Alanis Morissette sang that song, right? What if God was one of us? And the reality is that God was one of us. He is one of us. But she meant that, what if God was not God and just a human being? But that's not true. He is one of us, but he is also fully God. And so to lose the, the grandeur of that miracle, or to diminish it, it risks losing sight of the greatness of the Christian faith, the amazing love of God, and it also puts at risk not just uh, the faith, but also our lifestyle that God wants us to have as a Christian and a very relationship with God himself. So as we go through these verses, you'll see three things that uh, the incarnation reveals the truth of God, the incarnation reveals the love of God, and then finally, it reveals the victory of God. So it reveals the truth, it reveals God's love, and it reveals God's ultimate victory for us. Verses one to three, it says, uh, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit 
that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So, Paul, so John is saying, you have to test every spirit. Why is that? Because there were a lot of false teachers at that time uh, who were performing some kind of miracles, who were making prophecies, saying that they were filled uh, with a spirit or they were filled with the Holy Spirit, but they did not confess the, uh, the, divi uh, the humanity of Christ in that context. So uh, what John is saying is that the, the, uh, the truthfulness of a spirit and indeed the presence of the Holy Spirit who is the Spirit of God is not tied to any sign or miracle, but you have to test what the Spirit says about Jesus Christ. That is, if you put your faith in a spirit, you have to examine what that spirit says. And what is this test of truth? You know, truth for human beings, you know, we say truth is objective, right? That is correct. Truth is objective. But there is such a thing as people believing things to be true which are not true. There are many reasons why that happens. And one of the reasons was, at that time, this, the false teaching was accompanied by miracles and prophecy and so on. Even today we see this phenomenon where lots of people believe false things, but they absolutely believe it is true. You know, there's something called the Mandela Effect. I don't know how many of you have heard of that. It's named after Nelson Mandela. But the name comes from the fact that uh, the person, the researcher who coined that term, she, like a lot of South Africans, believed that Nelson Mandela died in prison in the 1980s. And so when he came out of prison in the 90s, if you remember that, uh, and then later on became uh, the leader of South Africa, all these people were like, we thought Nelson Mandela was dead. You know, and, and so this, this, this concept of a lot of people believing a false thing, but they absolutely can attest to the veracity of that. That's called the Mandela effect. There are many common uh, versions of that. You know, a lot of people will confidently say that Fruit Loops is spelled F-R-U-I-T. Loops, it is not. It's F-R-O-O-T. Loops. Uh, what eyeglasses does the Monopoly man wear? A monocle, right? Actually, it is not. The Monopoly man has no eyeglasses. You can take up any Monopoly box. There is no eyeglasses. But uh, every person I've asked that question believes that the Monopoly person wears a monocle. And, and people say it's because they are confusing uh, the Monopoly man with the guy who's on the planter's peanut stem. But this is what happens. Right? You think it is true, but you cannot test it. And when you test it, it is found to be false. So now, what is the test that John wants them to do? It is a test of confession. Verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That is the test. If the Spirit does not confess this, that is a false spirit. Regardless of whatever miracle or prophecy that spirit uh, performs. And so what is the confession? It says that you have to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So has come in the flesh, that is, that is history. He has come as a human being. He has come as man. But who is it that comes? It is Jesus Christ. It is not just the historical aspect that is important, that a person called Jesus existed, but it is Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That is, Christ, the Messiah, who is the Son of God, the divine second person of the Trinity, that specific person is the one who has come in the flesh. So that is the confession, and that is the test. So the false teachers 
at that time, like I said, denied his humanity. They denied that he had come in the flesh. But today, you know, we have Jehovah's Witnesses, they are Muslims, they deny his humanity. In the Quran it says that the likeness of Jesus with Allah is as the likeness of Adam. He created him of dust, then he said unto him, be, and he is. So Jesus is a created being. They deny his divinity. But John says, a true confession is the one that says Jesus Christ, the Son of God, second person of the Trinity, who is God, he came in the flesh and became man. So this is the test that is there from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 2 to 3, says that if the sign or wonder that he tells you, this is for false prophets, comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So this is how the Bible wants us to test the truth. The confession and the fact that we follow God is more important than any sign or miracle that you will see performed among you. And so John says the truth of God is revealed in the faith that is founded in Jesus Christ. And that faith is based on the historical reality that the Son of God has come, he has added to himself humanity, and he has stepped into time and into his universe on a particular date 2,000 years ago. And we know this is what John says uh, in 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 1 to 4. He says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son Jesus Christ and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. That is without truth there cannot be fellowship and there cannot be joy. Uh, so both fellowship and joy is founded on truth as well. Later on he says in this chapter, verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. The truth also gives us security. So to abide in God and to have confidence, we also need to hold on to the truth of God and the ultimate truth that Jesus Christ came into this world. So the incarnation reveals God's truth. Then it reveals God's love. It says in verse 8 to 10, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, this is, uh, I think, we, when we men came to uh, talk about our preaching, uh, when we, we are doing this preaching class on Thursday, I think Vijay was saying how someone mentioned this verse to him, God is love. So they, it's, a, it's a verse that uh, is, has an influence, you could say, that is disproportionate to the number of times it is actually mentioned in the Bible. How many times do you think the words God is love is mentioned in the Bible? Hundred? Anyone else? Only two times. Both in this chapter. This is the first time it says God is love in the Bible. And then later on, uh, in this very same passage, verse 17 or 18, he says again, God is love as part of another sentence. We know that God is love. It, it, we know it's evident throughout the Bible. It is evident throughout the Bible. That's why John can confidently say that God is love. You know, when you look at the covenants of God, when you look at the dealings of God with human beings, it is evident. So he can very confidently assert that God is love and we wouldn't question it. But the verse itself is only here. Today, most, many people take that verse and be like, what, what does God is love mean? They mean that love is God, right? That's not the same thing. God is love 
does not mean that love is God. It does not mean that God will do something that goes against his character. What is the love of God? The love of God is the character of God that he is someone who generously gives of himself. That is, the love of God is a self-giving love. It is not self-deprecating love. In today's world, if you say you love someone, you have to depreciate yourself in front of the other person. You do whatever the other person wants, right? Isn't that what like romantic love is all about? You know, people, all the boys, will, men will say, oh, I would go to the ends of the earth for you. Like it's, it's, it's all about you do whatever it takes to make the other person feel affirmed. So it's self-deprecation. But the love of God is self-giving. It is not self-deprecating. That is, God gives off himself when he does not need to. It is generosity that we cannot understand. And the next two verses tells us how that love is revealed. So if you read verse 9, Paul John says that all the activities of God, if you think in terms of uh, the word of God from Genesis onwards, there's creation, there is covenant, there is all the dealings with Israel, the calling of Abraham, the exodus, uh, you know, the, the Passover, all of that. Of all those things, the fact of God's love is manifested in this, in verse 9, that God sent, what is verse 9? It's manifest, that is, it's revealed that God sent his only son into the world. This is how we know that God is love. That he gave of himself by sending his only son into the world. There's no greater act of love than the fact that the Son of God came into this world. When we look at the word only, it is talking about the uniqueness and the exclusivity of the relationship of the Father and the Son in the Trinity. It is, it is a unique relationship. And it's an exclusive relationship. No other person is the Son to God other than Jesus Christ. We are all sons and daughters of God, but we are not the son. That's why it's unique and exclusive. You know, you see that same word used in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. It says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and when he had received, he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Now we know Isaac was not Abraham's only son, right, in, in terms of physical paternity. But Abraham had a unique and exclusive relationship with Isaac. So when we say God sent his only son, the father is saying, the one with whom I have this unique and exclusive relationship, I am sending down into creation. And he, in perfect obedience, comes down into this world. And how was it manifest? How was it revealed? You read that verse, verse 9. It doesn't say that this is how we know the love of God is manifest in us. Yeah, what does it say? It says the love of God is manifest among us. That is, it is a real historical event. Because when you say, you, if you were to say that the love of God is manifest in us, it raises the risk which many people fall prey to. It raises the risk that you will spiritualize that event and say that it is not real in a physical sense, but because we believe it, it is real in our hearts. John does not say that. He says the love of God is manifest among us. That is, in a group of people, a person came 
who was in their midst. And that person is Jesus Christ. And so the incarnation also then reveals the purpose of God's love, which is that we might live through him. That is the end of that verse. And, you know, if you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 10 of 1 John chapter 4, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So John is reminding us that the incarnation happened not because we prayed for it, not because people were looking for it, but it is the initiative of God, that even in our rebellion, he sends his son into this world. And what, for what purpose does he send his son into this world? To be the propitiation of our sins. That is, he was sent into this world to die on the cross for the sins of his people. You think about that death and you tie it to the incarnation. The death of Jesus Christ is a particular death. That is, only he could, he could die the death that he was supposed to. Right? If you're, uh, you have read the book, uh, Tale of Two Cities? Right? In that, you know, it's a picture, that book is often quoted as a picture of the love of uh, God and, you know, the, the sacrifice of Christ. But in that, uh, you know, the person who looks like the other person uh, takes his place, switches around. So the person who was supposed to die is not the one who died. But the death of Christ is a particular death. Only he could have died. No one else could have died in his place. It is an undeserved death. That is, he should not have died. Because it says in the Bible that the wages of sin is death, and he is sinless. He is sinless as God, and he was sinless in his humanity while he was here in this world. And then it is a specific death. It is a specific kind of death. That is, it is a death of immense suffering because it needed to be the propitiation for the price of our sins, past, present, and future. So in that sense, if you think about it, in the, Jesus Christ is probably the only person who was born with his death foretold in all of these matters, right? When he was born, the manner of his death, the nature of his death, the cause of his death, the time of his death, the place of his death, all of that was already set in motion. That is not true of any other human being. Even in the Old Testament, there remained the possibility, okay, let's assume, like, you don't know how you're going to die. But there remained the possibility that some people would not die. There was Enoch, right? Who else in the Old Testament? Anyone? Elijah. Elijah, yeah. You know, in the New Testament, you know, after the ascension of Christ especially, there is always a possibility that each one of us, we have the possibility that we will not die. In fact, when Peter gets jealous of John uh, in, in John's gospel at the end, he asks Jesus, what about John? And then Jesus says, you know, uh, not, not in like uh, a pro prophetic sense, but in like uh, in the sense of like, uh, this, there are some things you do not need to know. He says, if it is, if it is my will that he remain until I come, he, I come back, what is that to you? Right? He's saying that there's a possibility that John the Apostle will not die. Before he dies, Jesus Christ will come back. So every human being who is born, there is the potential that he will not die. And at the very least, you don't know how you're going to die. But Jesus Christ is a holy human being who is born. Not only is he ordained to die, but he was ordained to die in a very specific, particular and you think of that, he is life. He is eternal life. He is the one who is uncreated. Eternity is his by right. And to think that that person is the only one in the history of this world for whom death was a foretold certainty 
is the majesty of the grace of God in the incarnation. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that in his death, we might live. Because God loves us and manifested his love among us in that Christ has come in the flesh. And then finally, the incarnation reveals the victory of God. It is the path by which God enables his children to follow the lead of his son and gain victory over death and the world. Not just everlasting life to come, but a victorious life in the present. Verse 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Because Christ came and he died and he rose again, who is in us? Who, who lives in us? All right. Jesus Christ lives in us, but technically speaking, the Holy Spirit lives in us. The, that is, the, the Spirit of Christ indwells in us, and he is greater than he who is in the world. And that is a result of the incarnation. That is sequential to the incarnation. If the incarnation had not happened, then the Holy Spirit would not be able to live in us. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So the life we have, we lead in the spirit is more powerful than any worldly threat or temptation. That is victory because God lives in us. The Holy Spirit indwells us. It is the victory of a, of a power <coughs> that the world cannot overcome. But it's also a victory of solidarity. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He suffered and he triumphed, so he is also able to help us in our struggle. This is the point that John keeps coming back to. Because Jesus Christ came in the flesh, the relationship between God and us is not just a spiritual relationship, but it is a personal relationship. It is not just a relationship of command and obedience, but it is also a relationship of love and sympathy. And that is only true of the Christian faith. And Christmas is the, is the event that separates the Christian faith from every other religion because it tells us how this personal relationship between us and God came about because Jesus Christ came into this world. It is a relationship that is only made possible because he is God who becomes man. He came into this world, he died, he rose again, and he lives forevermore as fully God and fully man. So this season, spend a little bit of time thinking about the greatness of God's love manifested in the incarnation. Through that, may we deepen our worship, may we take confidence that because Christ has conquered, we have the victory and he, is, he shares brotherhood with us, he has a solidarity with us, and may we live joyfully like John exhorts us all to do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, this time. We thank you that as we come into the season, you have enabled us a lot to spend a few moments uh, to think about the fact that the Son of God came into this world and added to himself humanity. He took on flesh. Uh, indeed, he became like one of us, the lowest of us, a lot. He was born to die, and yet he lived his life uh, with with joy and with confidence and unwavering obedience to you in his ministry and in his works and in his miracles. And yet when the time came uh, for him to go to the cross, he obeyed even to the point of death. He did not take advantage of that which was his right. That is all the uh, power of Godhood, uh, the, the, the eternal uh, life to which uh, he was to which was his right, but instead he laid down his life a lot.
so that we might we pray our Lord that as we think about uh, the event by which he came into this world, that we reflect on the greatness of God and the grace of God and the love of God, that we can boldly say that God is love because he sent his son into this world so that we might live through him.